first one is digital transformation. It is critical and challenging. Insurers are investing heavily in AI and machine learning mm -hmm. to improve efficiency. Some players already reduced claims processing time, for example, by over 20% by using AI. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome in the studio Mostafa Ben Ghazala, who is partner insurance and financial services at Forvis Mazar, and Catherine Cernesson, who is head of actuarial function at Liberty Specialty Markets. Today, we will speak about the non-life insurance companies that relocated to Luxembourg after Brexit, and we will focus specifically on their challenges and the profitability. So Mustafa, let's start. Could you please give us an overview of the insurance market in Luxembourg, focusing on non-life insurance and Brexiters? Absolutely, Jerome. So the Luxembourg insurance market has seen substantial growth especially in the non-life sector. Since 2019, when the Brexit led UK insurers to relocate, Luxembourg has become a key hub. Non-life gross premium served by almost 400%, adding 12 billion euro annually. Mm -hmm. In the second quarter 2024, we showed the result that was published. published. Non-life insurance continued to grow with 4.5%. Mm -hmm. the, the life insurance, on the other hand, shows a remarkable 45% growth. Yeah, that's a lot. Yes, which is due mainly to the reverse trend from last year, linked to the evolution of interest rate. Back into our topic of today, so the Brexit has reinforced the market, for example, in specialty lines. The ripple effects are clear. Luxembourg insurance market is more diverse, dynamic, are globally integrated than ever. Oh, thank you, Mustafa. And Catherine, what are the challenges uh, facing non-life Brexiters in Luxembourg, and will they continue to have the same growth path? Well, specialty insurers are shifting towards a softer underwriting cycle. Mm -hmm. and they're likely not to grow at the same rate we have seen in the last five years. We're seeing a decrease in premium rates. It's impacting financial lines in particular, the likes of DNO, FI, or professional lines. The reduction in premium rates is driven by lower claim activity in COVID, and generally strong underwriting profitability in recent years. This itself has attracted more entrants to the market. Whilst we've seen recent catastrophic events such as the Dubai floods or the Baltimore bridge collapse, they have not been material enough to generate a rebound in rates. Insurers are working on their 2025 plans over the summer and where they still have plans for growth, there's a greater risk of them not being able to achieve their top line ambitions in 25. This, in turn, could generate pressure on expenses at a time where all players have to invest in technology or AI to remain competitive, as well as to meet increasing regulatory requirements. Thank you, Catherine. And Mustafa, <coughs> what are the main risks and pressures that non-life insurers and especially Brexiters are facing today? Yes, Jerome, the landscape is getting tougher. So for me, we can highlight two main risks. First one is digital transformation. It is critical and challenging. Insurers are investing heavily in AI and machine learning mm -hmm. to improve efficiency. Some players already reduced claims processing time, for example, by over 20% by using AI. But this requires a significant investment in technology, talent, and with the data being the key factor. Mm -hmm. Second main risk for me is regulatory compliance, which is a major challenge that's facing insurers today, which is keeping up with the EU regulations. With evolving rules like Solvency 2 and DORA, insurers are under pressure to reinforce their risk management. For door of, uh, those operating, for example, across both the UK and the EU, the complexity will be to balance between UK laws and EU requirements. Mm -hmm. The stakes are high. Staying compliant today is not just important, it is critical for survival. Yeah, absolutely. And Catherine, could inflation still be a threat to non-life insurers' bottom line in 2025? Yes, definitely. One could think the threat is not as acute as it was back in 22, where inflation reached 9% across the EU. Um, other, whilst most insurers have now recalibrated their pricing tools in response to inflation, all lines are not reacting equally. For shorter tail property lines, the exposure metrics used in pricing are well correlated with the ultimate cost of claims. However, third-party liability claims generally have long settlement periods. This means a claim on a policy underwritten in 20 could easily settle in 25 or later. There is an important legal cost component to the total claim amount, meaning that these lines are exposed to the rate of increase of legal fees up to the date of settlement. 
In addition, specialty insurers often write at high attachment exposures, which can have a gearing effect on inflation. Finally, casualty reserves are still exposed to legal system abuse in the US in particular, with nuclear verdicts linked to jury trials and litigation funding. Beyond economic or legal inflation, we're also seeing increasing claims trends linked to emerging risks, such as PFAS exposures or opioid-related claims. And uh, still for you, uh, Catherine, are there any other types of claims, trends that are concerning for you? Yes, um, definitely. The, the, the main other trend that is concerning is the increasing incidence of natural catastrophes in new locations where risks are not well modeled. Recent examples in Europe were the French and the Italian health storms events of uh, 22 and 23. Even in the first half of 24, we've seen above average uh, insured NATCAT claims globally. In addition, loss creep has been observed on European NATCAT ultimate losses, starting with storm burns in 21 and French hell in 22. But the best recent example is the July 23 Italian hell market loss estimate that went from an initial estimate of $2.2 billion to triple to close to $6 billion in the course of nine months. This is often linked to data regarding exposures not being complete, which is also linked to these perils not being modeled in third-party software. It's important that the European insurance players work together to improve the quality and the completeness of NATCAT exposures and claims data to reduce the uncertainty associated with these risks. Thank you, Catherine. And Mustafa, what solutions do you suggest to address these challenges and turn them into opportunities? Yes, Jerome. Just let not forget that the spirit of insurance is to anticipate the future and prepare for the unexpected. So the key to turning these challenges into opportunities lies in innovation and adaptability. For me, I can foresee three main possible strategies. First one, leveraging technology is essential. For instance, we already saw some insurers that uh, leveraging blockchain to enhance transparency and efficiency in their operation. Mm -hmm. Second possible strategy is the regulatory responsiveness which is another essential factor. With innovative technologies like RegTech that we can see in the market as of today, insurers can more easily adapt to new regulation across different jurisdictions. Third and final one, sustainability, mm -hmm. which is for me no longer just an option, it is a fundamental requirement. A good example is one insurer that launched already a coverage specifically for renewable en energy projects. This moves open up new revenue streams and demonstrate that sustainability can be a powerful driver for growth and innovation. And just one last reminder for me, ESG is not about only the E. Oh, thank you. And then, Catherine, maybe a word on the role of actuaries in the market to conclude? Yeah, so as actuaries, we definitely see the risks and challenges facing insurers as opportunities to add value to management, either in projecting financials or responding to regulatory requirements. We've seen the actual profession developed steadily in Luxembourg. I'm president of the Luxembourg Actual Association. I'm proud to say we now have more than 300 active members, compared with less than 210 years ago. The local actual community is very dynamic. We regularly have 60 to 70 participants attending our monthly conferences, and we have exciting projects in the pipeline, such as the creation of a master's in actual science at the University of Luxembourg, and the organization of an international actual association conference in Luxembourg in 27. And Mustafa, maybe a conclusion? Yes, I will try. So the Luxembourg land life insurance sector is at a key moment as of today. It's full of opportunities, but also challenges. Insurers who invest in technology, adapt to regulation and lead on sustainability will thrive. Luxembourg will remain a vital insurance hub, but only the most innovative and resilient will see the opportunities ahead. And what's last sentence to end up on my conclusion, it's not just about adapting to the future, but shaping it. Well, Catherine, Mustafa, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Jérôme.